So I think one of the things that, um, that initiated this conference is that the field is really good, scientific field more broadly, is really good at some things and not so good at others. And the things that we're really good at right now is changing behavior in the short term. We're also really good, I think, at changing um, people's knowledge and beliefs. We're not so good at changing long-term behavior. And some of the things that we're really good at have come about because of nudges, because of nudges and choice architecture and changing the ways that we present problems to people. Now, most of the work that I have done up until this point, so that's my introduction, most of the work I've done up until this point is on how to form habits and how to change habits. So let me very quickly go through just what I see as the sort of the basic um, definition of what habits are, and then you'll see where I've ended up with this work. And the basic definition is when you start doing something, you're usually quite thoughtful about it. You have to make decisions. If you're going to drive to work, you have to decide when to get to work. You have to decide how long it's going to take. In LA, you have to deal with the traffic. Over time, though, that behavior becomes more automated. And you actually learn a routine. So they don't have to think much about when to leave home or what your driving decision involves. Instead, your behavior comes to be cued by context. It's not so much thoughtful or goal-directed. And so if this is your research program, you end up spending a lot of time thinking about context. How do contexts activate behavior? And how can they be used to change behavior? Well, one approach that was popular in psychology a, a few years ago, but we ha don't hear so much about now, is the idea of um, affordances. That some contexts just afford certain types of behavior. They make action more likely more possible. This is the old Gibsonian notion. Also Don Norman did a lot of work on, um, on context. So context can make behavior more difficult by adding friction to it. And it can make behavior easier by reducing friction. Let me give you a couple of examples. We now have ways of quantifying the amount of friction in the environments, the context, performance environments that we're in. And this comes from modern technologies having to do with, um, with the internet and electronics. We have walk scores of neighborhoods that tell us how easy it is to walk. P um, and people who live in neighborhoods with higher walk scores, you can Google your walk score if you haven't done that. Um, people who live in neighborhoods with higher walk scores, they actually do walk more and they have lower BMI. Now, I'm not talking about causality here, because, of course, um, you might select a particular neighborhood based on the walk score. But um, there is some research suggesting that if you end up in one, that you do um, lose weight. BMI goes down. Proximity to parks. So people who live in areas closer to parks also tend to exercise more. Density of alcohol retailers. If you live in an area with lots of alcohol, you're more likely to binge drink. But there's also evidence that we construct our own home environments in ways that provide friction for some things and not others. Houses of kids who are overweight are more likely to have TVs in the houses and less likely to have fruits and vegetables available. And Wansink has done a bunch of work on kitchenscapes, um, on the kitchens of heavy people and less heavy people. <laughs> yes. OK. So let me give you an example of a couple of large-scale interventions that can be understood from this perspective. And one is the five-a-day fruits and veggies. Anyone remember this? 
This was really successful in one way. It was a tremendously large scale intervention. It was successful at changing our knowledge. We now know that we should eat more fruits and vegetables. It had no effect on behavior. In fact, consumption has gone down since the program started. But there's a really different intervention at about um, the same time, and that is the um, tobacco control interventions. And they actually added friction, friction to smoking. So, and they were able to do this because of the secondhand smoke concern, right? So politically it became possible to ban smoking in public places, to control cigarette advertising. You have to actually ask someone, right, for a cigarette. You can't buy it in a vending machine, and taxes. All of those things added friction to smoking. Smoking rates have gone down. So those are my two interventions. I'm out of time, so I will just say that the interesting thing in the current work I'm doing, I think, is how these friction, these points of friction in environments influence people's behavior. What are the avenues, the intentions, or the what we're finding is they influence behavior directly instead of influencing behavior. And then that may then have an effect on people's beliefs about what they should do. So thank you. <laughs>